So, welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and my semi-annual shop tour state of the channel address. I say semi-annual because I have been doing this every year right on the first of the year for the previous year, kind of giving you an overview of what's changed in the shop and giving a tour to all the new people we picked up. But I did skip 2023 and we'll go over that in a second. But I'd like to take a quick look at what we have around here. Now to make this video different from all my other end of the year shop tour videos, we're gonna be taking a quick look around and all we have, the current layout, and the second half of this video, I'm doing a shop makeover. We are going to radically improve this shop. Uh, this has really much, pretty much stayed the same since I moved into this place three years ago this month. Uh, you can see, I'll put a picture up there of, of within a few weeks of us moving in. And the layout, you know, if you move into a workshop, things have to change. You kind of get accustomed to it. And after three years, I kind of want to make some efficiency changes to the shop layout. And we'll do that in the second half. But if you are new to this channel this year and you came for the hand tool woodworking lessons or you've gone through any of those series I've done, this is the main setup of all the tools. And I am one of those people that prefers to have a tool wall versus a tool chest for the simple reason, I like the fact that I can be working here. If I need a tool, I literally reach behind me, grab the tool, use it, and put it up. And my feet don't even have to move to do that a lot of times. Whereas if I had a tool chest, it's more like you go over there, you pull out all the tools you'll be needing in the project, you kind of spread them out all over your workbench or behind you or whatever, stuff like that. You use them all day long, and then you put them all back at the end of the day. To me, this is just so much easier. Uh, plus there's less cleaning at the end of the shop. The downside to that one is dust gets does get on your tools. And if you're in an environment that's kind of moisture rich, well, that sawdust will attract moisture and you'll get rust spots on it. But I'm in a semi-arid area of the country in the Texas Hill Country. So rust has never really been a problem for me except for a few times. And that's just, you know, you take a brittle pad and just wipe it off and no big deal. I do do oil my tools occasionally. I'm very lax on that one. But even my hand saws, like the first things that rust most of the time, they are perfect and I don't do anything to them other than just sit them on the wall. Now this is important to me in that you see everything I use, even the tools I don't use that often are on my wall. This is all I got that I use. So it looks like a lot to people, but this is also 20, 30 years of tool acquisition. So it's doable in my mind. You don't need a huge shop to do a lot of the stuff I do. And that's kind of why I like having it here as a display also. I have really come to like this uh, chalkboard. It makes a mess, but it's much better for the camera than the old whiteboard. It doesn't blow out the image as much. One of my favorite things about this shop is actually was an afterthought. This you know, standing desk over in the corner. It's cluttered right now, and I'm going to change it up quite a bit in the remodel, but I'm never not going to have a small standing desk somewhere. I love being able to draw over here. I will bring my iPad and keyboard right over here. It's just kind of a catch-all for office-related stuff that isn't in the shop, so it's just perfect for my application. If you have a chance to put a standing desk in your shop, do it. I never really do any woodworking over here. It's all office related stuff, but it did give me a place for putting all my power battery hand tools up there too. Opposite my workbench is my main power tools. I have a table saw that's typically cluttered up because I really don't use it that often. I have a jointer, which once again, it's in the background. I have my router table that acts as a outfeed table and is a place for me to put crap all over the place. I seem to be more that I would dimension lumber with my power tools and then most of the project is spent over at my workbench doing hand tool work and stuff like that. Finishing up, joinery, that kind of stuff. And that takes most of the time so this kind of works for me. 
you will notice that everything, including my table saw, is on wheels so that I can move it around the shop. Now this shop is only about 420, 450, I'd have to do the math. I do have a hallway in the back, which I don't think I've ever shown y'all before, uh, that kind of adds to that one. But this is a shared shop. This is half my dad's shop, so I kind of have to be able to move stuff around. Uh, you know, my dust collector, uh, drill press, mortising machine, and dad's bandsaw. Now, one thing I really like about this setup, and, it, and we actually purposely did it this way, is making all the tools that are going to be cutting stuff in line over on here. The bandsaw is my tallest tool, and it's really the only tool where I will do really long projects. In fact, in, a up, in my teardrop build, I'm going to be doing a bent lamination uh, timber frame design for it. So I'm going to have to resaw 20 feet of wood. I can do that with this setup because I can move everything around and I can go from outside that door to outside that door in line. Works great that way. I've done it once or twice. We can do it here. My table saw it's kind of a little bit lower and there's only a small area right here in front of the slop sink for me to stand and work. But in all reality, I never really rip more than four foot boards for the kinds of projects I make. I'm not doing huge tables or anything like that. So that's more than enough space. But if I do need more space, I can always lift it up and just move it over and once again, there's a door there and a door there that I can go 30 feet plus if I needed to, which I can't imagine I would ever do. Mainly, that's just kind of mentioning rough lumber that I've already cross cut to close to size. So four foot is more than I need up there. And my router table being in plane with a table saw makes a great outfeed table. Now in the power tool area, I do want to bring out a honorable mention because this little 10 inch bandsaw I'm now keeping next to my uh, bench because I this is a true luxury for me because if I'm if I want to rip a you know two three foot section a lot of times I just come over here if I'm doing Morris tenants a lot of times I would do it there uh, if it doesn't have to be you know visually perfect if it has to be visually perfect I'm grabbing my hand tools but this has just become a great little apprentice for me. Uh, I've always liked having a small thin blade bandsaw on ready to get re set up, ready to go. But because I'm a wood turner, I've generally had to have a thick heavy blade on my uh, bandsaw all the time. So this is kind of a return to how I used to work 15 years ago and I'm enjoying it. If you don't have a small, uh, bandsaw, even if you have a big bandsaw, have a small one set up for fine work. It makes life nice. <laughs> and that brings us to the part of the shop that is the money maker for me. Uh, pretty much half my income comes from production woodworking that I wholesale, mainly to toy stores. In fact, pretty much all to toy stores. Uh, most of my woodworking, I'm standing behind this lathe working away very rarely, even moving my feet other than to turn around in place. I got my iPhone over there playing podcasts or music. I got my noise canceling earbuds in. I got loud uh, air filtration going on and you can see me sitting here day in, day out, it seems like sometimes, but it pays the bills. Uh, you might also be noticing that we now have four lays in the shop. Yeah, we're down one lay. Uh, I sold my mini lathe, M-I-N-I, because dad had one, and when we combined shops, the mini lathe is pretty much solely dedicated to demonstrations because it's light and small, and I can carry it around uh, to art markets and stuff like that if I'm going to be demonstrating turning at that particular event. I did, when I sold my mini lathe, I picked up a midi lathe, M-I-D-I, and this is the lathe that I've been doing all my start wood turning series, and I'm going to be getting back heavy into that in 2024. Something to look forward to if that's why you came to my shop, my video channel, instead of the hand tool woodworking. I did this one because 
I felt a disconnect a lot of times if I was working on my professional machines with professional looking tools to people just starting out. So by doing my demonstrations on the mini originally for on my YouTube channel and then stepping up to this MIDI, I just felt a little bit more relatable. I will always recommend something like this MIDI if you already know that this is a hobby you want to do for a while and you're just getting into it because it has enough power to do most everything people want to do. It can be extended out with extensions. So if you want to do long chair rails or baseball spats or anything like that, you can do. But it has things like reverse uh, adjustable speed, that kind of stuff. It's kind of the entry level where you're going to get those characteristics. Most minis nowadays have a variable speed, but they don't have reverse. And that's kind of important to me. So this is also what I'm going to be taking on the road when I do my travel series so that I can keep up with my production woodworking going around the country. Uh, so that's another reason why I picked that up over keeping my, my personal mini. My main workhorse is a one-way 1640. Uh, I have used and abused this, and I'm actually getting to a point where I'm having a few issues with it that I can't diagnose, some electronic issues. It's getting really loud, which could be the bearings, and it gets warm, but the manufacturer tells me I'm never going to wear this out. But the sound is kind of interfering with my mics and getting some feedback, so it doesn't really work for filming as well as some of the other things, which is why one motivation for doing a shop renovation at the end of this video. Now, my lathe right here kind of works the halfway point, and the reason why I had it set up this way with a large gap in between my lathe and my dad's lathe, A, it gives me a working area, but it also gives me an area that I could be here with my camera work equipment around here to do filming. That's why I needed so much space when we did this plan originally. And here's a funny thing. Right behind me in all those videos is basically a Bugatti in the lathe world, a robust American beauty. And what's even weirder is I've never turned on it. Oh yeah, I've taken a few shavings. Maybe dad hands me a tool and you know, a few shavings, but I've never done a full project, not even a top on it. Uh, it's one of those deals that, this might sound strange, it's an idiosyncrasy with me, but you know, I spent a good decade working at motorcycle dealerships, and I could tell you, those that are working in the service parts and sales department are not going to be the wealthiest people. So a lot of times our personal machines are a little bit older, a little bit more clapped out. And it's one of those things that if you ride some of the most exotic motorcycles for customers and all that kind of stuff all day long, and then you hop on your bike to get home, you're always somewhat of a little bit let that down. So I never used this one, so I would never know what I was missing. <laughs> and it's always been kind of a running joke, people seeing all this equipment behind me in my videos about using uh, other people's tools, that kind of stuff. But uh, this is my dad's setup. He has quite a few more tools than I. That right there is my entire tool setup. And I can tell you that 95% of the all the wood turning I do is with a one inch skew, a three eighth spindle gouge and my roughing gouge, which these tools just sit here all the time. Uh, I am getting a point where this is getting a bit crowded and in the makeover, I'm going to be fixing that solution and giving me a little bit more room, but that's for the second half of the video. Dad, on the other hand, has, you know, all his chucks and drive stuff. The tools he uses most often inside all these drawers are more tools and stuff like that. He did just adjust this a little bit in the past year for, he, did, he took down a lot of his wood turning tools and put them over here. So they're all readily available and easily findable for him. This is also where we have our sharpening set up and because we combine shops, you know, we have, I have some few excess uh, setups over up around there, which if you've gotten this far in the video, understand one of the main motivations for me doing a shop renovation at this point in time is I'm going to be putting hands on every single tool I have in this shop 
and we're going to be having a garage sale video in the upcoming. Any tool that I am shippable, I will give my patrons a first shot at it, and then I will put it up, and announce it uh, via video and on my website, so you can going to be able to get some good deals on tools, especially considering that at one point in time, actually twice, I've tried opening up a woodworking school. So I have enough tools to teach hand tool woodworking classes to 12 students. And I've now kind of come to the conclusion that that is all capital sitting on a shelf somewhere that I would rather use for my teardrop project. So all that kind of stuff is going to be going up in the garage sale. Don't email me or contact me saying, hey, if you're doing this, I'll buy it now. I'm just going to ignore all those. Nothing goes up on, for sale until I've offered it to my patrons and that video goes live. Just a little preview for all those that have stuck around so far. But here's our sharpening setup and this is going to be dramatically changed. Dad has now given me permission to also radically change his entire area to make it more suitable for the hobbies that he's picked up. He really hasn't turned much in a couple years and he's gotten really interested in some of the art uh, classes that they teach at the university. So we're gonna fix this up so he can do that kind of stuff here. It also means that I have access to film now on this uh, machine for all my bigger, more complicated stuff that won't work with the MIDI. So this is gonna be the film area now, and we're going to do something with my lathe in the remodel. Which brings me to this back storage alley which I'm kind of embarrassed to show y'all, but I've never really shown y'all, and it's going to be part of the remodel, so it'd be kind of nice to get a starting point. As you walk in, you'll notice I have my welding equipment here. This is a new acquisition for me. Uh, Harbor Freight had a sale on some of their rolling carts, so I made myself a, a welding cart for that kind of stuff, and this is just here. I don't have it very well organized. Right in the front section, you will see where I store all my long material. I do not buy rough sawn, kiln dry, dimensioned lumber very often. And when I do, I definitely don't want to keep it. To me, that is money spent. And if you're just laying the wood up against a wall, it's money wasted. It, is better, it could be better served uh, on something else. Uh, so if I buy lumber, I'm going to use that lumber as best I can um, so that I don't have capital just leaning against the wall. Right here is the last of my art market display. Over the past two years, uh, since COVID hit, I have not worked an art market, which killed my inventory on the retail, I mean, my income on the retail side. Uh, until this past month, I worked my first art market since COVID uh, then. And this, my display has kind of been butchered and reused. I'm going to be using this in the remodel, which means an upcoming video will be building an entire new setup for my retail uh, work at art markets. But the idea of me not wanting to waste lumber laying on the wall is truly hypocritical when you see what's down this hallway. This is kind of shared storage for me and my dad. My art market supplies, tables, that kind of stuff sit right here, backup, stuff like that. I have shelving going all along. That is all old jigs, old tools, redundant tools, uh, woodworking school tools, all that kind of stuff. And that's the stuff I'm going to be going through and probably putting in the garage sale. Here is some more hobby stuff for me. Uh, and then hardware and, uh, project uh, material. Then from about here all the way down are wood I've set aside to dry. I've been drying this kind of stuff since 2015 uh, with the idea that once I've got it, bulk of it to a certain point, I would start making boxes and high art pieces that can go to art, val art galleries and that kind of stuff. That point was two years ago and I just haven't gotten to it. So a major goal of mine is to begin working my way through, doing about a quarter of that stuff every year and replacing it with, that, with new material to start drying. So every four years I get a turn going on for quality wood that isn't available 
from a hardwood dealer or stuff like that. These are trees that I've harvested that I've made a lot of bowls out of and then set aside premium stuff to do with elsewhere. Dad has this side of the shop and he just has a lot of stuff that I don't really know what it is. Uh, we also have our dust collector and we have his uh, air cleaner and then the water heater for the shop and apartment. But this is just a disaster zone with a lot of stuff, equipment that we don't use uh, that we're going to be purging and putting that money towards making project, which you all see on the woodworking channel. And that's the shop. I would probably say maybe it's 500 square feet if you include that back hallway. The one addition that, the big addition I've done to the shop since the last 2020-20 uh, tour is you will notice that there's shelving all along the top right there. And that is dedicated to drying bowls. I have a few logs out in the uh, yard that in January and February, I will be uh, processing them into rough bowl blanks and putting them up here since it is an air conditioned room with the goal that they should be ready to finish turn in September and October, getting ready for the next holiday season. Yes, if you are a woodworker like me, your January and February, you are processing and preparing for the following uh, holiday season, even though Christmas was literally yesterday for me as I filmed this. It's just the way of the world if you're using free material. And that brings us to the state of the channel address. I'm always kind of hesitant about doing this, but when I've done it in the past years, people seem to find interest in it. It's a little behind the scenes baseball of how a channel is doing. And I will tell you this, uh, I didn't do this video in 2023 for the 2022 year for the simple reason I was kind of embarrassed and disappointed in how I had done my performance. I hadn't produced a lot of videos and the videos I did produce, not all of them were of the quality I like to think I make uh, or I've made in years past. And it kind of, it's stupid because in 2022 in my video, I was really excited about the future. I had spent that November and December behind the scenes reformatting my catalog of content because a big name company had kind of uh, given me advance and they were bringing me on in a group of creators to produce something kind of cool utilizing my back catalog. And that was going to give me the advantage a lot of other YouTubers out there that have teams of editors, filmographers, that kind of stuff that I just never have, never will have. Uh, I just don't want to do that. Uh, but I could leverage that one. It would be a small bonus income coming into me and it would spread my name out quite a bit with the content I make. And again, that was November, December. I canceled a lot of art markets I was working at that time to do that kind of work. That's what the advance I justified was kind of paying for. Uh, the week before that 2022 tour video uh, um, announced, uh, they had gone public with a dozen creators that they were announcing for this project. And then the week after that video, I was supposedly going to be in a Zoom meeting where everybody on the team was, we were just gonna hit go and go live. But when I logged in, it was just the president of the company and my handler. And within a 45 seconds, it was, we think we're going in a different direction. We thank you for your work. Uh, the advance is yours. That's that. And that kind of put me on a bummer for a few while, which is why I went for three months without really publishing any content of real value in my mind. And something happened in that time period that really enlightened me and it showed me how mature my channel is. If you compare it to a normal brick and mortar business, most businesses have a growth cycle where it's exponential growth those first few years then kind of peters out. And then after you know five, 10 years, you kind of hit your stride. For another five years, you got some slow growth and then it kind of levels out. The owners of those companies can either reinvest in their business, but a lot of times if you reinvest in your business, because you have a certain customer base, 
that reinvestment is not going to get you back to that exponential growth. The smart thing would to, to do would be invest in an entirely different business or maybe an ancillary business to that customer base and grow them up because that will get exponential growth here until it peters off and then you reinvest elsewhere. That's how normal businesses work. Well, I am to the point where I took three months off and my income did not change. No more views happened. Uh, I mean, the viewer count was up, stayed about the same. My subscriber rate stayed about the same because my catalog of content is very evergreen. Very rarely do I follow trends out there. Uh, in fact, you can count the number of projects I did on my channel in the first 300 videos on your hands. It was all educational content, textbook content. And that just has a certain level of market viewership. And then when I came back and started producing more videos, I had a few videos that did very well, went viral in comparison to my other stuff. And what happened? I have my viewer count, which is a level uh, line on a graph, you know, months coming down here. And then I had a spike for a viral video. But because the audience number didn't grow, what happened is that if you get a spike here, they only have a certain amount of time, so this number went down a percent or two. So it all came out in the wash. So what I learned was it doesn't really matter a lot what I do in the future. And that gives you a lot of freedom. And it kind of came to me probably about six months ago. So I don't have to do a weekly video to maintain my numbers because it doesn't really matter. They are going to stay the same. Uh, I'm willing to bet if I didn't make another video ever again, I would probably have two or three years of income where it would go down maybe 10% that first year, 10% the second year, and so forth, until it just wasn't a, a relevant source of income. And that is very consistent with a lot of other mature YouTube channels. You know, they're 10, 8, 10 years old. You just hit a, hit a growth free cycle. Uh, some of those reinvest, make giant warehouses and stuff like that to make more content. Others take that money and reinvest it in ancillary businesses to come at this, their audience the same way. I think the second way is a smarter move. But for me, it means that I can focus more on quality than quantity. And I look forward to the fact that in 2024, I'm probably going to be producing some of the best work of my career but it won't be stuff going after the algorithm. Uh, it's going to be long form content. And you can see right here what that's mainly going to be. Uh, I'm continuing on the art market projects because that allows me to show y'all how to do a single exquisite project with just hand tools. And then in the next video, show you how to maybe batch them out utilizing power tools and jigs and stuff like that to sell in art markets. I can then take that product and go sell it so I can get income all different areas. I'm going to head back to the EDU series that start woodworking. Uh, we were in the sophomore year. I'll probably do a junior year of content there. And then the start wood turning, I will finish that one up. And then I am going to be doing some shop projects because part of this remodel that we're going to start today, uh, there are some things I want to build for the shop. And then, there's that travel series. Yeah, that one's a bit of a letdown for me. Uh, my goal was to spend 2023 building that teardrop trailer, and I have got the trailer, physical trailer built, it is now wired, licensed, registered, insured, all that kind of stuff. I just haven't gotten the camper built. And the goal was to have the camper built by now so I could be testing it out over the holidays. And then in spring, summer, and fall, I can take off and do all the traveling. But I just haven't had the funds to do that yet. Uh, 2023, I've kind of been spinning my wheels. Um, you know, I have a set income from my work. I've been trying other things to bring additional money in. And this is, sounds really naive to all y'all business people out there, but if you are earning a set of amount of money based upon a time block that you have and you take time away to go earn mo other money or develop other incomes over here, 
this shrinks. So it all kind of offsets and I never earned the additional money on top to build the material for the camper. But I don't want to give up on that travel idea. So I've been thinking of shrinking that concept down, which is probably a smarter decision to test the waters. And instead of having a nice comfortable camper, I might just be having a tent and a sleeping bag strapped to the back of a motorcycle to allow me to travel around uh, and visit some cool places to make cool content. But that right there is my goal for videos in 2024. I anticipate that is going to be one third my income because it was, a, it was about half my income last year. My wholesale was about half my income last year, and I'm talking toy stores there. I think it's going to be about one third this year, simply because I've lost so many stores this past few months, and it'll take me time to build that uh, client customer base back up there. But what I'm finally returning to is that retail side, direct to customer sales for the tools, the art markets, that kind of stuff. And I'm hoping that'll be a third of my income and thus give me a little bit of additional income so that I can build that camper for the 2025 season. So that is the state of the channel. A little bit longer than normal because unusual situations and we covered two years. So how about we get to remodeling this shop? Come along for a montage and then we'll come back and show you what we did. Okay, that's enough of that. Nobody wants to watch a fat man move furniture. So, first thing I did was uh, I wanted to use that stand that the bandsaw was on for a uh, stand for my turning tools. The video I did previous to that is how I organized all the turning tools in my dad's section. We'll briefly cover that there. The reason why is because I had this thing right here. This was a giant cabinet I built for my dust collector. It's actually one of my more popular videos out there. This whole center section right here held a cyclone and stuff, the bag and everything like that. I'm going to be using this as storage for all my turning blanks because I make them by the thousands and up until now I've just had them on the back corner of my table so because I really don't know where to put them. It's the most economical way to do that one. And then this will be for my tiny bandsaw and I can just roll it around wherever I want at any time. It, it moves pretty easily otherwise it'll just sit right there. The other thing you might notice is in the background. If you'll notice I took those uh, art market stands and I actually put them on the wall. The problem with that though is that is mortise and tenon uh, design. It's a ladder, ladder style but it's all mortise and tenon. So there was really nothing preventing the weight uh, from kind of over time causing this to come down. So you'll notice at the very top at the front leg, I anchored it to the ceiling so that can now hold quite a bit of weight. And for now, it's a good place for me to put all of my uh, battery powered power tools. Uh, I would be doing something slightly different from with some of them, and I'll show you that in a second. Oh, forgive all this mess that's above my table saw and uh, router. Uh, nothing's changed with those locations. I like those there. This is where I've been putting stuff that probably go in the garage sale. My dad told me of a lot of stuff that he wants to unload too. So it's all collecting up. The big changes happened at this side of the shop. And again, I did an entire separate video on how I organized my dad's section. But 
The reason why I originally put this one way diagonal right here was so I could get the camera all the way around it. But that created one extra hallway, to, so to speak, in the shop. What I kind of wanted to do was put this against that wall because I'm not really going to be filming on it. And then dad had his giant table that I was going to put in the center as kind of a catch-all project area and stuff like that. It was just too, a bit too big, so I ended up reversing them and put the lathe in the center. That way, it basically has one, the standard hallway that I had with the lathe the other way, but it shares this main hallway, which cleared up a lot of space. I then relocated this one uh, tool wall over here. This is where I had all my personal turning tools, and I'm going to turn that into a power tools that I use at the workbench quite a bit storage area and the reason why I'm stopping and filming this portion of the video now is because all those can be smaller videos in the future so it won't be as long. I also reset all this for my production turning area. Uh, this right here is basically my weekly allotment of what I, I target to get done. That's 300 tops I try to do every week. Last year it was 250. I didn't always make it but that's the goal. I don't want to up it up this year. So I fill that up on Monday and hopefully by Friday it's empty and I know I've done my weekly job. And here's my new tool cart that I redid. Gives me a little bit more space. It's actually a little bit higher so I can actually store stuff underneath it and I can roll it to either this lathe or my dad's lathe on whim, which I really like doing that one. Real quickly, I'll show you what I did on dad's. Took down that tool wall that was kind of half used and relocate over there. I'll show you that in a second. I also brought in the first nice workbench I ever built. This was built out of some scraps from the cafeteria gym. Uh, at the whole high school, I got flooded out. They were throwing it all away, so I basically built that thing for free. And uh, the reason why this is all cluttered up is I'm building stuff now. We're going to have videos on three different cabinets I'm going to build here in the coming weeks, uh, just so I can get all this done and out of the way. And then I brought him up something underneath the tape, underneath the uh, window. That way he can set up his easel here or in his uh, turning bay and it'll give him place to store all his painting stuff, so which hopefully he'll enjoy. In his lathe area, we organized our tool walls, organized all his tools, I rebuilt the tool wall from over there to over here. I had to build a few things. All this right here is his sanding supplies and he liked having that one. Since I took it down, I'm going to redo that as a video and make it a little bit more uh, useful in my mind. I also uncorked his vacuum setup and have it up here. And I'm, I'm, I need to cut down on the plumbing so it doesn't need to be as long. Uh, but that way his vacuum for his vacuum chucks just right there, hooked on a switch. So he can use that anytime and just make it easier. Now I'm not gonna show you that back hallway because it is disorganized big time. I am pulling tools out, the bigger tools that uh, power tools are going, are in my carport at the moment until I put them up on the marketplace and stuff like that. Uh, Dad's area is pretty cleaned out so we can restock it with supplies or bowl blanks or stuff like that. Uh, the stuff that you see up there, that is a really cool setup for a very large bandsaw, an industrial bandsaw that he used to own and he downsized to this Grizzly. I just need to refabricate it. And what that thing does is it allows you to take small logs and mill up really fine boards for furniture making and that kind of stuff. And he liked to use it because you can also take and cut bowl blanks on a mechanism just doing a crank not the way you've seen me doing a video kind of freehanding it. It makes it a lot more consistent that way and probably a lot safer. I just need to reorganize that and I will probably hang those behind the bandsaw as soon as I do that. But it's kind of a mess right now simply because it was just a good break point because I need to start building those cabinets and might as well make those a whole video. I hope you enjoyed this, saw a few things that might give you some ideas for your own shop. But remember, in the end it's just worth the effort to learn, create stuff, and share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.